Welcome, Dr. Epic here. And in this lecture, we're going to discuss all the different Pocahontas's, an accidental explosion, a love story featuring agronomy, the peace of Rebecca Wolf, and the oldest treaty in America. We're going to follow that outline right up above my head as we discuss the salvation of Jamestown. And all of this information is in service to a single question, and that question is right there. Why did so many colonies fail? What factors enabled Jamestown and Plymouth to succeed? Describe the origin of these two colonies and their challenges. Explain their success. And finally, what were the implications of that success? So keep that question rattling around in your brain and start cogitating and building an answer to address the issues raised in that question. Now, we left off with Jamestown in 1607. The entire colony is teetering on the edge of failure. Its government is paralyzed by factional infighting. Everyone in the fort and in the colony is on the verge of starving to death. The Powhatan are systematically stripping the colony of anything useful it might have. And the colony is just on the verge of failure, of going the way that all those other failed colonies before it went. But Jamestown has something that those other colonies didn't. And that something is Captain John Smith. Captain John Smith, hired by the Virginia Company in 1607 to command their soldiers in the New World. Because you see, John Smith was actually already famous by 1607. As a young man, he had become a mercenary in all of these wars across uh, Central Europe. And he ended up particularly in Southeastern Europe uh, fighting for the Hungarian Count in this conflict known as the Long War fighting the Turks all across Hungary and Poland and Wallachia and all of these different places. Uh, he's involved in a big battle where he takes on duels by three separate Turkish knights and he cuts their heads off and he's captured and sold into slavery and he escapes from slavery, makes his way back to England. So by 1607, John Smith is kind of already famous, which is why the Virginia Company hires him. But the thing you need to understand about John Smith is John Smith looked like that. He was short, he was stocky, he was hairy. He did not look like this Hollywood idol from, you know, the Disney movie. He didn't have the voice, you know, of Mel Gibson. Um, you shouldn't think of that when you think of John Smith. What you should think of is like the saltiest, rudest, crudest soldier you could think of. And that's John Smith. John Smith rubbed a lot of people the wrong way because he said what he thought and he thought what he said. And he told people the blunt truth and not what they wanted to hear. At any rate, uh, John Smith's faction gains control in Jamestown and he, he is elected governor uh, in 1607. And he, with his soldiers, is able to kind of impose a military order and military discipline on this failing colony of Jamestown. And he says, he does two things right off the bat that save the colony. One, he establishes that if you do not work, you will not eat. And when everyone complains, he just starts quoting the Bible at them. He that shall not work shall not eat. 2 Thessalonians 3.10. Captain Smith prevents hoarding. People aren't allowed to sort of hide food in tents or in their hovels. He enforces common stores. He builds a strong house, and that's where all the food is going. And at the end of the day, everyone gets their portion of food. Everyone gets equal portions. The nobles don't get more, and the indentured servants don't get less. And he makes sure that absolutely everyone works on the farm, regardless of social status or occupation. And this rubs a lot of people the wrong way. You have people that are like, I shouldn't be working on the farm. I'm, I'm a nobleman. My father is like a duke. John Smith don't care. You go and work on that farm or you don't eat tonight. And then people are like, well, I'm a blacksmith. I just repair the tools. I, don't, I shouldn't be working on the farm. Captain Smith is like, if you want to eat tonight, you're going to go work on that farm. And one of the things that John Smith does he says, forget about this. Forget about European food. We're not going to plant wheat or barley or peas or apples or any of that crap. We are going to plant the same thing the Native Americans plant. Uh, the three sisters. Corns, beans, and squash. It's good enough for the Native Americans. It's going to be good enough for us. Everybody's going to eat succotash. The English absolutely hate this American food. Uh, the farms begin to actually work. John Smith says, we can't fix any problems until we are self-sufficient. And under Captain Smith, the farms actually start to produce food. The common storehouse starts to fill up with food. Everyone's getting full bellies. But the problem is, is it requires so much effort and it's such backbreaking work. Everyone hates John Smith. Almost everyone in the colony who's not like a member of his faction really starts to hate John Smith. 
and a lot of the nobles don't like being pushed around by a stocky, bearded commoner. The second thing he does is John Smith negotiates better trading terms with the Native Americans. He says, okay, if a Native American shows up, you send them right to me. We're not gonna have these Powhatans show up and just start looking around for like the skinniest Englishman and then cheating him out of his tools. If a Native American shows up, you send them straight to me and I, I will set prices. This is how much we're trading for corn. This is how much we're trading for deer skins. This is how much we're trading for beaver pelts. None of this getting cheated out of our own tools is gonna go on. And the Native Americans are quite upset at this. And they demand that John Smith can't really make these kind of decisions. And he becomes, he, he gets an office of Cape Merchant. So he goes out to go negotiate and find Lord Powhatan himself. And he goes out into the woods where he is actually captured by Opie Cancanu, uh, the king of the Pamunkey, and dragged to see Lord Powhatan, Wahum Senecao himself. And uh, John Smith is greeted as a guest and they sit down to meet and uh, the conversation does not go well because John Smith like is a very blunt person and says very blunt things. And Lord Powhatan does not like the, some of the things that John Smith says. So he gets tired of John Smith and he says, you know, hold this guy down on a rock and smash his brains out. Uh, and this is when an 11 year old girl stands in front of Lord Powhatan's executioner and starts basically berating her father, Lord Powhatan. And this is Mata Oka, who later becomes known as Pocahontas. Pocahontas actually has three names. And uh, she saves the life of John Smith. This is a very famous story from, from John Smith's general history. And uh, Lord Powhatan is very amused by this. She's quoting tribal law at him. She does not look like a 23-year-old fitness model. She's basically a naked 11-year-old girl who's basically just berating her father for attempting to execute a guest in his own home. And she saves the life of John Smith. And John Smith is grateful to her, to her for the rest of his life. In fact, he writes very glowingly of Pocahontas in the future, uh, including a letter to Queen Anne, and we'll discuss that uh, later. Now, this is where we meet Pocahontas, and this is where you have to understand that there's not a single Pocahontas, but rather there's stories and myths about a dozen or so different Pocahontases. And getting to the actual historical Pocahontas is actually quite difficult because she's buried under so many layers of myth and narrative and fiction and story and collective memory and popular imagination and, and Disney movies, that it's really hard to talk about Pocahontas. And the Pocahontas that does exist in the collective imagination uh, differs wildly. And Pocahontas has always been used as a historical narrative. Uh, in the uh, 18th and 19th century, uh, Pocahontas was used uh, by the southern states as a kind of countermeasure against the narrative of the pilgrims up in Plymouth. And she here she is portrayed as, you know, kind of the original southern belle, you know, demurely showing a single shoulder. Uh, and later she's kind of portrayed as, you know, the mother of the South. And that painting right up above my head for, for decades, that was said to be a, a portrait of Pocahontas uh, and her son. Uh, but that was, that's been later disproven. That's not Pocahontas. And, you know, we've got the Disney movie where Pocahontas is sort of this person in balance with, with nature and she like talks to a tree and stuff. Uh, and then there is a, a, a sort of a Native American view that kind of emerged in the uh, early years of the 21st century that kind of portrays Pocahontas like as this victim. You know, she had an earlier husband and she had an earlier child and this earlier family was wiped out and she was abducted by the English and, and she was raped by some English soldiers. Um, and that is kind of an, a narrative that emerged over sort of recently discovered, you know, sacred uh, oral traditions of the Mataponi people. Um, but the thing is, is that none, none of these Pocahontases reflects the real Pocahontas that we do know about from the 17th century. Uh, and even, uh, the oral traditions that says that, you know, Pocahontas was sexually assaulted and had this earlier family that was all killed. Uh, even the historiography of that has been seriously questioned. Uh, and, and in my opinion, uh, it is unlikely to reflect actual historical events because the image of uh, the image of Pocahontas as this kind of victim uh, doesn't really mesh with what we know about Pocahontas and Lord Powhatan 
from the original 17th century historical record. So let's drill down. Let's actually just look at stuff that was written in the 17th century. What does this actually say? What can we actually infer about the real Pocahontas, the historical Pocahontas? So we've got basically four points about Pocahontas that we know from John Smith's general history that other Englishmen wrote about her. One, as the daughter of Lord Powhatan, she is a sacred woman. In fact, she is very likely one of the Quikros, one of the sacred women who can kind of go from nation to nation to nation within the Powhatan Confederacy unmolested. Uh, she often represents Lord Powhatan across the Confederacy, and she especially deals with Jamestown because she learns English very quickly. Uh, the English struggle to learn Algonquin. I think John Smith is one of the few people that actually learns to speak Algonquin. But you see Lord Powhatan, when the English show up in 1607, uh, Lord Powhatan is already in his mid to late 60s. He's getting old and he doesn't like to travel. So what he does is he will send out Pocahontas as his emissary. And the English have these accounts of being in like a really distant corner of the Powhatan Confederacy, sort of exploring Virginia. And they'll be in this really distant village and they look up and like in will walk like Pocahontas surrounded by like her bodyguard of like 20 or 30 soldiers. Uh, this happens a lot. Pocahontas shows up in all these different parts uh, of the Powhatan Confederacy representing her father, Lord Powhatan. And that makes it very likely she is in fact one of the Quikros. She is described as physically striking and or beautiful. She is a really interesting figure. The English are very, very unaccustomed to Pocahontas. This very forceful royal woman capable of telling them exactly what she wants to happen. And we actually have a portrait and a drawing of Pocahontas that is taken during her lifetime. And we'll see it in just a bit. Pocahontas acts in very forceful ways. This is why this idea of Pocahontas as a victim doesn't seem to really agree with the 17th century historical record. Pocahontas acts like the daughter of a king. She acts in forceful ways. She doesn't ask the English to do things. She just explains to the English what is going to happen. All right. She often shows up at Jamestown. She becomes kind of the go-between between, between Lord Powhatan and Jamestown. Uh, she often will show up. She will dictate what the local sort of king of the nation is going to do. She explains what Lord Powhatan wants to happen. She commands rather than asks. This, she acts like the daughter of a king because she's the, she's the daughter of a king. And she, together with, with uh, even though she's quite young, uh, together with John Smith, they sort of come to a new set of trade relationships between the Powhatan Confederacy and Jamestown, and it starts to function. Jamestown is no longer being cheated of all of its different stuff. The farms on Jamestown are functioning. The English are being fed. They're being fed with succotash that they don't like at all, but they aren't starving. But again, people don't like this. They don't like John Smith. The English are incredibly resentful that John Smith is telling them what to do. He's making them work on the farm. He's telling them what their relationships with the Native Americans are going to be. And this is why John Smith gets blown up. In 1609, John Smith is injured in a gunpowder explosion. Uh, now, it is it might have been his enemies in Jamestown trying to kill him, in particular, a guy called uh, John Ratcliffe uh, tries to kill, uh, maybe tried to blow up John Smith. Now, John Smith, for the rest of his life, John Smith says it's an accident. He's very cagey about what actually happens to him. Uh, a satchel of gunpowder next to him explodes while he is asleep on a boat docked on the James River at night. All right. Uh, and this is what makes that explosion very fishy. It's an explosion at night. It's very wet. It's on the river. And somehow this gunpowder spontaneously explodes. A satchel of gunpowder spontaneously explodes. It blows off most of the meat of his leg and almost kills him. Uh, and uh, John Smith is actually forced to return to England on the next ship to convalesce. He spends most of his life, you know, basically crippled and trying to sort of rebuild his life back in England. He goes on like one more voyage up and down the coast of New England, but that's about it. 
But in terms of the historical record, this is actually a good thing because John Smith spends most of the rest of his life in England writing about his adventures in Virginia. In fact, it's weird because he was on all these wars in Eastern Europe, but it's Virginia that captures his imagination. John Smith doesn't fall in love with Eastern Europe. John Smith falls in love with America, and, and he's quite good at what he writes and what he draws. I mean, that is his map of Virginia right up above my little yellow box. But he misses America really deeply. And uh, this is one of his quotes about America that John Smith writes. He, Even though the, he, they tried to kill him in America, he never forgets his love of the country. And this is a quote uh, from John Smith. This is the type of stuff he writes. And here are no hard landlords to rack us with high rents or extorted fines to consume us, no tedious pleas and laws to consume us with their many years' disputations for justice, no multitudes to occasion such impediments uh, to good orders as in popular states. Uh, so freely hath God and his majesty bestowed those blessings on them that will attempt to obtain them, as here every man may be master and owner of his own labor and land, or in the greatest part of his time, if he have nothing but his hands, he may set up trade and by industry quickly grow rich. Spending but half that time here, which in England we abuse in idleness, worse uh, or as ill, here is ground as good as any that lieth in the height of 41, 42, 43, he's talking about latitudes, uh, which is as temperate and fruitful as any other parallel in the world. John Smith crippled after this explosion in 1609, is writing about the American dream. He's writing about how anyone can come to America and work hard and become the master and owner of his own labor and land. All you need is nothing but your hands and your own industry, and you can become rich. John Smith, 1609 encapsulating the American dream, that anyone can come here, work hard, and prosper. Following Smith's injury, there, there followed a long drought and the beginning of a long, cold winter. Uh, Lord Powhatan knows what's coming. He's like, it's getting colder. There hasn't been a lot of rain. So what Lord Powhatan does is he forbids the Confederacy from selling corn to Jamestown. He says, look, it's going to be a very, very hard winter. Stop selling corn to the English because we are going to need all the corn we have to get through this really rough winter. Um, the new governor that replaces John Smith, a guy called John Ratcliffe, uh, says that this is unacceptable because as soon as John Smith leaves, the people quit working on the farms outside of Jamestown. People aren't forced to work on the farms, so they don't. The farms in Jamestown start to fail, but the English think, we'll just buy corn from the Powhatan. But Lord Powhatan has forbid them from selling corn to the English. So the new governor, John Ratcliffe, uh, says this is unacceptable. So he goes out and he meets with Lord Powhatan to demand a resumption of trade. John Ratcliffe appears, Governor Ratcliffe, appears to Lord Powhatan and says, look, the agreement you made with John Smith is still in effect. You agreed that all this land belongs to King James of England. You are the subject of King James. I am a noble and a servant of King James. Therefore, I outrank you and I command you to start selling corn again to Jamestown. That's John Ratcliffe. And Lord Powhatan listens to this uh, rant against him. He listens to these outrageous demands. And then Lord Powhatan says, okay. He or then orders his warriors to seize the English. All right. They disarm the English. They put all of the people who arrived with John Ratcliffe off to one side. One side. They seize John Ratcliffe and tie him to a tree and strip all of his clothes off. And then Lord Powhatan summons the evil old women of the forest. He summons the evil old women of the forest. You know things aren't going to go well when the evil old women of the forest show up. So he summons the evil old women of the forest, and he says to the remaining English, I am now going to teach you how things work in the Seneca Macau and what happens when you disrespect the king of the Powhatan. And he orders the evil old women to go to work on John Ratcliffe. And they build a fire in front of John Ratcliffe. And they take little razor blades made out of mussel shells. And they start to peel back the skin 
from John Ratcliffe's torso. They cut the skin from his torso in long strips, and each time they cut a strip of skin off, they throw it into the fire. And they take all the skin off of his torso, and then they take cords, and they tie the cords on his ankles, knees, and hips, wrists, elbows, and shoulders. And then using their razor blades, they take off his feet and throw them in the fire. They take off his hands and throw them into the fire. They take off his lower legs and throw them into the fire. They take off his lower arms and throw them into the fire. They take off his genitals and throw them into the fire. They take off his upper legs and throw them into the fire. They take off his upper arms and throw them into the fire. And they are peeling the meat back from the flesh of his skull. They're taking his face off. Uh, and this is when John Radcliffe dies. And they peel all the flesh off of his skull and throw his face into the fire. Then they cut off his head. They take his torso into five or six different parts and throw them all into the fire. This is the death of John Ratcliffe. And then Lord Powhatan turns to the remaining English and says, I have now given you the gift of knowledge about what happens when agreements are made and broken. I made an agreement with John Smith. I did not make an agreement with John Ratcliffe. And what is to be found of John Ratcliffe? He's gone. So if you ever watch the Disney movie, uh, that in the Disney movie is John Ratcliffe. And even though he's a horrible Disney villain uh, in the Disney movie Pocahontas, you should have a little sympathy for him uh, because John Radcliffe met a truly horrible end. There's no leadership in Jamestown. And without leadership, the Jamestown settlers begin hoarding food. They start stealing food. They're not keeping common stores. Uh, without Smith after Radcliffe, um, the Powhatan get very upset. And they get very upset because a group of starving Englishmen attempt to steal corn from the Powhatan. These 18 Englishmen are out in the woods looking for food. They, st they stumble across a cornfield. They steal all this corn to try to make it back to Jamestown, but they're caught by Lord Powhatan. Lord Powhatan has them held down, and he takes the, the corn cobs and he puts them in their mouth, and he hammers the corn cobs uh, down their mouth, and then slits their throats, and then dumps their bodies in front of Jamestown. And then he says, look, you English, you guys are thieves. Therefore, you are not allowed to leave your fort. If any Englishman leaves his fort at Jamestown, I will have them killed. So the Powhatan basically lays siege to the fort, killing anybody who leaves, killing anybody who goes into the woods looking for food. Things get very very rough at Jamestown. They haven't made enough food from the farms. They can't buy corn from the Powhatan. They can't even go hunting in the woods because the Powhatan will kill them. And the result is a very hard winter. The resulting winter is known as the Starving Time. This is the winter of 1609-1610. Of the roughly 500 colonists that were present when, you know, John Smith was blown up, during that winter, 440 of them starved to death. And the survivors, the survivors make it through the starving time by eating each other. They turn to cannibalism inside the Jamestown colony. Um, they start to eat the bodies of the dead. Now, there have been a lot of historical rumors about whether the people in Jamestown actually ate each other or not. This was decisively settled uh, in the early years of the 21st century when the archaeology at Jamestown clearly proved that there are human remains with butchering and boiling marks to be found uh, inside Jamestown. They are clearly eating each other during the starving time. Many of the bones have sort of what's called polish on them that comes when you boil bones to make broth. So they turn some of their fellow colonists into like soup. And in particular, uh, here there's a, a, the remains of a 14-year-old maidservant who was chopped to pieces and turned into food. Uh, terrible, terrible times. This is a, like an indicator of like how valuable Captain Smith's leadership was, that without John Smith, they basically eat each other. Now, I want to pause here and talk about the archaeology of Jamestown just for a brief second. Because Jamestown is situated on land that's like really, really terrible to grow anything in, uh, once colonists are established in other parts of Virginia, they abandon Jamestown almost completely. 
And the result has been that Jamestown is a nearly perfectly preserved archaeological site. The archaeological record at Jamestown is absolutely amazing. It's all funded by the federal government. All of the information from Jamestown is free. Their website is incredible. And, and you are urged to go there just because, like, you're actually looking at the artifacts of John Smith and John Radcliffe, and you're looking at artifacts that Pocahontas herself stared at. You know, the first, the origin of America, you can actually study the archaeology of it. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, the website is called uh, Jamestown, Redis Jamestown Rediscovery, uh, and it is absolutely wonderful, uh, absolutely wonderful website. Absolutely incredible research. Now, the, they actually... The, the surviving cannibals of Jamestown actually decide to abandon the colony. They say, look, this is, this is really bad. We shouldn't be like eating each other. They make the decision to abandon the colony. They're like, we don't know what happened. The third resupply convoy never arrived. We've got to go back. So they start making plans to sail back to England and abandon the colony. And they are actually in the middle of this. Some of them are actually headed down river when they encounter ships sailing upriver, it is the long lost third Jamestown resupply. So the colony is saved by the appearance of these supply ships from England, literally at the nick of time. It's saved by the appearance of these overdue supply ships in the third Jamestown resupply. It carries a new royal governor, a man named Lord Delaware, uh, who is able to restore some degree of order at Jamestown. He's like, look, John Smith said this place is only going to succeed if we have, like, military discipline. So Lord Delaware imposes a new military discipline on Jamestown. However, funding the third Jamestown resupply basically bankrupted the Virginia Company. Uh, and even without Captain Smith, it is still kind of wobbling on the verge of failure. Uh... The Powhatan are still laying siege to the fort. They're still not allowed to hunt in the woods outside of Jamestown. And even with the arrival of the third Jamestown resupply, the colony is still on the edge of collapse. And Lord Delaware says, we have to make peace with the Powhatan. So he sends out an expedition uh, to talk to Lord Powhatan. And while they are out there, they encounter Pocahontas and they make the decision to kidnap her. So to prevent uh, Powhatan from destroying the entire colony, the English organized the kidnapping of Lord Powhatan's favorite daughter, Pocahontas herself. But this is, again, a very weird historical event because they basically convinced Pocahontas with her bodyguard to get on the ship, to get it on, get it on an English ship, and then they kind of surprised her. They're like, ah, now you're a prisoner. And Pocahontas just kind of rolls with it. She just kind of shrugs and goes, okay, well, I... I Guess I'm being kidnapped. Uh, Pocahontas does not seem being does not seem to mind being kidnapped, and they take her to Jamestown, and they don't like lock her in a room or anything. They give her free range of of the fort. Again, she's been to Jamestown many times. She knows the people that are there uh, because it seems that during the starving time there was a fundamental power shift within the Powhatan Confederacy, because they do eventually find Lord Powhatan way back in the woods. But the Lord Powhatan they meet after the winter of 1609-1610 uh, is a very different Lord Powhatan. The Lord Powhatan that John Radcliffe encountered, the Lord Powhatan that disassembled you know, John Radcliffe, uh, was a very forceful, a very commanding king. The Lord Powhatan they meet later on in 1610 is kind of this laid back, relaxed guy. He's way out in the woods. He's no longer commanding hundreds of soldiers. He's just kind of relaxing, you know, in his cabin in the woods because there seems to have been a big sh internal power shift within the Powhatan Confederacy. And what it is hypothesized is that Opie Can Canoe has basically seized power within the Powhatan Confederacy. And he did this during that long winter. Opie Can Canoe basically seized power inside the Powhatan Confederacy, more or less forced his brother into retirement. I mean, he's not going to kill his brother, but he kind of forces him into retirement, which is why, you know, the, the Powhatan that disassembled John Radcliffe was so forceful, but the Powhatan they meet not even a year later is just kind of this relaxed, retired dude in the woods who is already over 70 by now, so he's willing to embrace retirement. But with the retirement of Lord Powhatan and the ascendance of Opie Can Canoe, 
there's no longer any role for Pocahontas to play. Remember, her role was to be the emissary of her very elderly father. Uh, and with her father in retirement, there's nothing for her to do in the Powhatan Confederacy. Opie Kankanoo was probably just going to marry her off. So this is probably why Pocahontas doesn't mind hanging out with the English, because there's nothing for her to do uh, in the Powhatan Confederacy. They at least respect her as a noble, or Opie Kankanoo probably does not. Now, one of the things that that third resupply carried was a fellow named John Rolfe. John Rolfe is an agronomist, or he was an agronomist, and he was interested in the science of agriculture. And in particular, John Rolfe was interested in uh, growing Central American strains of sweet tobacco. And the English had wanted a tobacco colony for a really long time. They tried to set up a tobacco colony in South America, and it fell apart. And there was an idea that they're going to start a new tobacco colony in the Caribbean, and that's what John Rolfe wanted to be part of. But it was too close to the Spanish and it couldn't be protected. So John Rolfe had to give up on that and he ended up in Virginia. Uh, and he doesn't really want to be in Virginia because they don't, the idea is that they can't grow sweet tobacco in a temperate climate, that you need a kind of a hot tropical climate to grow it in. Or at least that's what John Rolfe thought. So John Rolfe wanted to be part of this tobacco colony in the Caribbean, but many of the islands were too vulnerable to Spanish attacks. So he ends up in Virginia. He doesn't really want to be here. Now, but the problem is, is that he doesn't know how to grow tobacco in Virginia. He knows everything about the sweet tobacco from Central America. I mean, that's what it is. He knows how to cultivate it. He knows how to nurture the seed pods. He knows how to cure the leaves after they've grown, how to bind it so it won't rot on a long ocean voyage, the process of growing and curing it. But he doesn't know what the water and soil conditions are in Virginia, because tobacco has to get very, very precise soil conditions or it just dies. And in fact, people have talked about growing, they were talking about growing tobacco in Virginia, you know, way back in 1607, but none of them could actually get it to work. None of them could get anything to grow, actually. But locked in the Jamestown Fort, present as a prisoner in the Jamestown Fort, there is somebody that knows all about the local Virginia tobacco, the wild tobacco of Virginia. So we have John Rolfe here. He knows about the sweet tobacco of Central America, but doesn't know how to grow it in Virginia. And here, there's someone who knows how to grow tobacco in Virginia, but only the wild tobacco that was used by the Powhatan. And they meet in 1610. And that person he meets is Pocahontas. That is the real Pocahontas on the left. And this is the, the Quikros theory of Pocahontas. The idea is that Pocahontas was a sacred woman of the Powhatan Confederacy. She is the daughter of a king. She does act as an emissary across, across the Powhatan Confederacy. So she would know about the cultivation of the wild uh, tobacco of the Powhatan Confederacy. But John Rolfe knows about the sweet tobacco of uh, Central America and they can combine their knowledge and grow tobacco in Virginia. It's equal parts John Rolfe and Pocahontas. And they don't just combine their knowledge, they combine their personhood because they seem to fall in love during this period. And this is where we have the marriage of Pocahontas and John Rolfe. Pocahontas converts uh, to Christianity. She takes a new name, Rebecca Rolfe. Pocahontas, the original Becky. Here is a painting of the marriage of Pocahontas and John Rolfe. They're married in 1614. And this is known as the Peace of Pocahontas. That establishes peace between the Jamestown colonists and the Powhatan Confederacy. And people show up at the marriage of Pocahontas. Lord Powhatan is there because it's his daughter. Even Opie Kankanu shows up because, I mean, it's his niece getting married. Uh, and they are able to cultivate tobacco together and their tobacco that they start planting in Virginia sprouts like weeds and it takes off and they start making really high quality tobacco in Virginia. And England had already embraced the smoking habit. There was nothing more English, you know, by the 17th century of sitting in a pub with an English beer puffing on your pipe pipe, hanging out with your friends. Even fancy ladies started smoking tiny little feminine cigarettes. 
and uh, they had been looking for tobacco for a really long time, but they had been forced to buy tobacco at the really inflated Spanish prices from the Spanish New World Empire down in Central and South America. But in the New World, in Virginia, they start to be able to create new strains of tobacco and to feed the English market. And they start to make money. They start to make a lot of money. They start to make stupid amounts of money. By 1615, Virginia tobacco is beginning to be shipped to England in large quantities. Tobacco is exploding across the Virginia colony, and it's making them enough money to sustain the colony. It's making them enough money to pay off a bunch of old debts from the old Virginia company. The colony begins to uh, make substantial cash, and it starts to attract people, large numbers of colonists who show up, who've read the writings of John Smith that say that anybody who shows up here can work hard, can become rich, as rich as John and Rebecca Rolfe. John, Pocahontas, and their son, Thomas Rolfe, emerge as one of the leading families of Virginia. And they saved the colony. And they become kind of so famous that in 1617, they're actually asked to travel back to England. And they're invited to visit the Queen of England herself. And her name is Anne of Denmark. And uh, to get introduced to the Queen, you actually need a letter of recommendation. And one of the people that writes Pocahontas, Rebecca Rolfe, that letter of recommendation his old crippled John Smith, who writes this beautiful letter that was never meant to be published about how the efforts of Pocahontas saved both him and because of the tobacco, because of the love story over agronomy, tobacco agronomy, they saved the colony. And they meet the queen. Everyone is very happy. Everyone is very impressed. Uh, Pocahontas takes a... Uh, takes a, a couple Powhatan with her, and they are less impressed with England. Um, and they're getting ready to head back to Virginia because Pocahontas wants to return. And they're waiting for favorable winds at a town called Gravesend in the English country of Kent. And while they're there, uh, Pocahontas... <coughs> she develops a cough, and the cough turns into a fever. And the fever turns into pneumonia, and Pocahontas dies. And she is buried at the town of Gravesend in Kent, which is leads to one of the odder things about American history. That if you want to visit the final resting place of this, you know, Native American princess, you have to go to England. And there is her gravestone right there on the left, the grave of the Indian princess. Rebecca Rolfe. Brokenhearted, uh, John Rolfe takes uh, their son and actually makes it back to Virginia, where he continues to be uh, a large-scale planter until 1622, until his death. And uh, Thomas Rolfe inherits a lot of his lands and actually becomes the foundation for uh, the great families of Virginia. Many of them are descended uh, from Thomas Rolfe, who's far more important than Virginia Dare. I mean, Thomas Rolfe was a real dude and had lots of kids. He's not like some white ghost of a white doe wandering the woods of North Carolina. Now, Jamestown serves as the foundation for much larger uh, expansion around the Chesapeake Bay. That these, these little towns, these villages just explode. The countryside just ripples, and these forests are cut down and replaced with tobacco farms. And then, uh, because of the faltering uh, agriculture of the Native Americans, trees are cut down and turned into farms of corn and wheat and barley and all this stuff to feed the people working on the tobacco farms. The entire colony of Virginia becomes dedicated towards the large-scale cultivation of tobacco. Soon, farms, small ranches, and tobacco plantations cover most of the entire area. Now, Jamestown itself is largely abandoned uh, in favor of much better land, because again, the, the land around Jamestown itself is terrible. Uh, and in fact, in 1699, Jamestown ceases to be the capital. The capital is moved uh, to Williamsburg, Virginia. And Virginia becomes the largest, the wealthiest, and the most prosperous of all of the English colonies in North America. And it is all based on tobacco. And here we can look at the economics of tobacco. They start exporting just truly stupid amounts of tobacco back to England. Virginia becomes the great tobacco colony of the British Empire. And you can see that chart on the upper left. I mean, it just, 
it's a geometric product it's a geometric progression of the cultivation of tobacco and all of this has been documented wonderfully in a book by uh, Arthur Middleton all about the economics of tobacco exportation in colonial uh, in the colonial era and if you look at those the quantification of that in the middle you can just see how much tobacco they start to export by 1619 they're exporting 20,000 pounds of tobacco you know, by 1639, that's turned into like one and a half million pounds of tobacco headed back to Britain. And if you look, you know, by 1753, Virginia is exporting 53.8 million pounds of tobacco. That is the growth of the tobacco industry in uh, colonial America, in Virginia. It's absolutely stupendous. The explosive growth of the Virginia colony really starts to worry Opie Kankanu. And Opie Kankanu, who wanted to wipe the English out at, back in 1607, Opie Kankanu plans for an attack on the English colony. And they do this in 1622. Uh, Opie Kankanu organizes a massive attack on the settlers in Virginia. And he orders his warriors to infiltrate into the settlements, infiltrate into all the little farms and towns and at first light to fall upon their English friends. And they do this. And more than a third of the colony is just wiped out in the course of a single afternoon. That's what that depiction is. As people who thought they were on really good relations with the Powhatan are completely stunned when their friends seize knives and daggers and war canoes and tomahawks and just start beating the English to death. The English are devastated by the massacre. Uh, in 1622, many of the outlying farms and plantations and ranches are immediately abandoned. People crowd back into the old dilapidated fort at Jamestown, and they they beg Opie Kankanu to come to terms. A message is sent out to Opie Kankanu and says, Oh, great King Opie Kankanu, uh, this was a terrible attack you just did. We were taken unawares. Clearly, you have won this war. We would like to meet to discuss uh, a treaty, a peace treaty, uh, detailing the new relationship between uh, the Powhatan Confederacy and the English colony. Opie Kankanu agrees to this, and he decides to send all of his leading war captains to these peace talks of 1623. Now, Opie Kankanu himself does not go to these peace talks, either as a, as a measure of contempt for the English or just because he had to do something else. But at any rate, all of the leading war captains of the Powhatan go to these peace talks of 1623. They sit down with the English to hammer out a new relationship between uh, Jamestown and the Powhatan Confederacy. The English inform them that, well, these are peace talks, so it's customary to start uh, peace talks with a, with a drink of wine. And they pour wine out uh, for everyone, and the, the uh, Native Americans start drinking the wine, and they don't feel well and Native Americans start to throw up, they start to vomit blood because the English poisoned the wine. They asked, they asked an English doctor to pour poison into the wine. And as the leading war captains of the Powhatan are reeling from being poisoned, the English jump up, seize their daggers, and stab them to death at the end of these peace talks. And in a single afternoon, they've wiped out the leadership of the Powhatan Confederacy, killed half of the kings of the Confederacy itself, almost catch Opie Kankanu himself. This is followed by a vicious series of attacks against all of the villages of the Powhatan Confederacy, and lacking their war captains, lacking their leading warriors, uh, the Powhatan are massively defeated uh, in 1623. Opie Kankanu is forced to sign a humiliating treaty in 1644. He himself is captured. He's dragged to Jamestown and forced to parade through the streets. And when he objects, an English soldier just stands up and shoots him in the back. Thus dies Pocahontas' uncle. Opie Kankanu is captured in 1644. He dies shot in the back uh, by an Englishman. This is the end of the Powhatan Confederacy. As colonial Virginia expanded, the Powhatan Confederacy just withers. It's buffeted by waves of infection brought by the English and these very occasional, very bitter fights with the ever stronger colonists. After 1623, the Powhatan are not militarily stronger than the Virginia colony. In fact, they're much, much weaker. And the Powhatan Confederacy itself you know, broke apart. And of the 30 odd nations that made up the Powhatan Confederacy, only about two of them have survived to the present day. And as part of that 1677 treaty, they were required to pay an annual tribute of beaver skins to the colonial governor. 
Now, after the beaver was hunted out of Virginia, they were allowed to modify the treaty to turn it into two deer. And oddly enough, that 1677 treaty, that treaty is still honored to this day, making it one of the oldest continuously honored treaties in American history. It's been continuously honored for almost 300 and 50 years. And every year, the survivors of the Powhatan Confederacy show up at the state capitol to deliver their two deer to whoever is the current governor of Virginia. And here is the modern governor of Virginia accepting the tribute and honoring the 1677 treaty. Now, the deer themselves are, uh, they're butchered and turned into chili and that tends to be served in homeless shelters. At any rate, you should have really good ideas how to answer these questions about Jamestown. And if you don't, sit down, look at your notes, and cogitate. Why did Jamestown succeed when all those other colonies failed? What did Jamestown have that the other colonies did not? And will Plymouth have the same advantage? Because we're going to relocate our interests north. We're going to talk about the Plymouth Colony in the next lecture and the difficulties that they had and what allowed them to succeed like Jamestown succeeded. But that is in another lecture. And I will see you there. Oh, now, uh, if you are interested in uh, learning about the Jamestown uh, colony, if you really want to get into, you know, exactly all of the trials and tribulations, I've, I've had to ignore a lot of really keen and probably critical details in this lecture because it's already too long. Uh, these are the books that were primarily used to build this lecture. A lot of them are really, really quite good. Uh, and if so, if you're interested in this, I would suggest these books to you. Or if you know someone who is like really keen on early American history, these would be the books I would recommend. Uh, Love and Hate in Jamestown is a, a really good book, featuring John Smith quite prominently. If you're interested in the first women that showed up in Jamestown, there's the Jamestown Brides. They were sold at auction uh, on the riverside. They were sold at auction on the ocean side. Uh, Bernard Balin's uh, The Barbarous Years, all about these really rough years in Jamestown. Uh, that's that book. That's the book to read right there. And it's a, it's a big, thick academic text. It is serious academic history. If you want kind of a spin or a recreation of Native American politics, there's Helen Roundtree's uh, Pocahontas Powhatan and Opie Can Canoe, all about the Native Americans. Uh, there's Benjamin Woolley's discussion over there on the lower left, Savage Kingdom, which I reread recently. Uh, the Woolley book is really, really good. Uh, even though uh, Benjamin Woolley like, does not like John Smith. He does not like John Smith like one bit. Uh, and if you're interested in the archaeology uh, of Jamestown, there's William Kelso's uh, Jamestown, The Truth Revealed, all about basically demonstrating how you know, cannibalism was present during the starving time and how you know, exactly the material culture reflects the historical record as was recovered uh, from Jamestown. And yeah, they're quite good books. They're, they're all very good books, and they look quite handsome on your bookshelf. They, they, they really do.